Let's look at another game from Bronstein's book on the 1953 Zurich tournament. Uh, this was a round one game between Nydorf and Ryshevsky, and it was a Nimzo Indian, an opening we have been studying lately. We have a few videos on it. And here, uh, Nydorf played e3, and we've been looking at the response b6 um, in our recent videos. But black goes for c5, which I believe is called the Hubner variation. And uh, c5, I was trying to understand this move. It does attack white's center. Um, it, it allows the knight to be developed behind the pawn. Uh, pawn usually comes to c5 in queen's uh, pawn openings. Um, so it, it looks okay. I also wondered if another point of that move is a3, uh, allowing the bishop to go back to to a5 because then b4 can't be played. The pawn has that square covered. But when I looked at the database, if a3 is played, which is rare, the bishop never retreats to a5. It always takes the knight. So I guess that's not really the point. I suppose the point is just to pressure white's center. Uh, another thing I was questioning um, in the Nimzo lately is um, in a lot of lines I see this knight coming to e4. So I wondered, can, can it go to e4 right away here? Is that a variation? Apparently, no, the engine hates that. Uh, the knight has insufficient, insufficient support there. White can play queen c2 to attack it and guard his knight. And maybe black tries to maintain it a little longer with f5, but then bishop d3 attacks it again. And so black's got to give up his post on e4. He can take the knight. But then b takes c3, attacks the bishop, it can retreat, and then white gets an excellent pawn center. So you can't put that knight on e4 too early, I suppose. Uh, we looked at variations where b6 is played first, and then the knight comes to e4 in some lines, supported by a fianchettoed bishop. Anyway, in this game, c5 is played, uh, bishop d3 to control e4, uh, castles, knight f3, and d5. That looked like a strange move to me um, because in a lot of lines of the Nimzo that I've been looking at, black doubles the white c pawns, and if black plays d5, he's allowing c takes d5 to occur, undoubling those pawns. But uh, Bronstein has a comment here. I'll, I'll read from the book after d5. Uh, he says, Nimzovich never used to advance his c pawn to c5 without need. He hoped that after he gave white doubled pawns, sooner or later he could induce white to play d4 to d5, after which he could establish his knight at c5. Okay, so his plan was keep that c pawn back, double the c pawns, induce white to play uh, d5, and white would have pawns on d5, c4, c3, and the c5 square becomes an excellent outpost for the knight. It cannot be driven away. Okay, but Bronstein goes on to say that modern, the modern master puts no great stock in that far-off prospect of capitalizing on the doubled c pawns. Instead, the immediate counterattack on the center with every means available has become one of the standard ideas. So black plays d5 here and just continues to attack uh, white's center. All right, so white castles, knight c6, a3, uh, bishop takes knight, pawn takes bishop, and then d takes c4, bishop takes c4, queen c7. Now let's look at the position um, and see what the plans are on both sides. And Bronstein tells us, he says, the placement of white's pieces radiates a great deal of potential energy, which ought to be converted into kinetic. I love that line. Uh, white must set his center pawns in motion, activating both his rooks and his deeply buried dark square bishop. I also like how Bronstein sp spells dark square as one word. Uh, the most logical plan would seem to be the advance of the e-pawn, first to e4 and then to e5 to drive black's knight from f6 and lay the groundwork for a kingside attack. So white wants to arrange the advance of the e-pawn, free his bishop to come to this uh, diagonal, and then even push it to e5 and drive that knight away. 
Um, so he says that's what white should be doing. Uh, reading further, it says black in turn must either prevent the E pawn's advance or counterattack the white pawn center, which will lose some of its solidity the moment the pawn advances from E3 to E4. So as soon as uh, white moves his pawn forward, that pawn becomes a little less stable, and black can continue to attack the center. In this game, Ryshevsky, who's playing black, combines uh, both of Black's ideas to achieve a favorable disposition of his forces, while Nydorf does not put nearly enough vigor into the execution of his plan. So he criticizes Nydorf in this game and praises Ryshevsky. Okay, so after queen to uh, c7, I was noticing the queen was in line with this bishop, which is loose. So I was wondering, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, what can happen? Well, there aren't any good discoveries with the knight. Uh, for example, knight takes d4 simply allows queen takes d4 to guard the bishop. But it's something white has to think about, his loose bishop on c4. So white plays a4 in this position, kind of, kind of ignoring what Bronstein was saying he should be doing, expanding in the center, maybe rook to e1 or something. But he plans to develop his bishop to a3, and... Uh, Bronstein really doesn't like that. He says, of all possible continuations, this one may be the least logical. It resolves only one minor problem, the development of the queen's bishop, and to a poor square. The pawn at c5 will find defenders, and the bishop will find itself out of the action. And that outflung pawn at a4 will not be a jewel in white's position either. So that pawn may come under attack. All right, b6, logical, supporting c5, getting ready to fee and cut the bishop. Bishop to a3, bishop to b7. And now this bishop on c4 retreats to e2, probably to guard the knight and get out of this attack, potentially. Rook f d8 lines up with the white queen, so the queen sidesteps to c2. Then uh, knight to a5. And that's clearing the way for the queen here, and I suppose that's uh, somewhat of a threat. If black plays c takes d4 next, then white cannot play c takes d4 in response because his queen would hang. Okay, so white has to think about these things. So white actually plays d takes c5, ruins his pawn structure, but also correspondingly ruins black's pawn structure. Okay, so they have symmetrical pawn structures. Uh, then c4. Bishop e4 attacking the queen. Queen c3. Rook a b8. And look at black's power in this position. He has the two open files. Uh, white's rooks don't. Uh, the bishop is controlling the b1 square, so the white, a white rook cannot contest the b file. This b3 square is under black's control by the knight and the rook. He can place a rook on b3, perhaps. Maybe fork the queen and the bishop. Okay, or get his knight down onto b3. So black's position is better. Okay, and this bishop is like, like uh, Bronstein warned. It's just staring at a, a, a pawn here, a brick wall. Rook fd1. Uh, rooks get exchanged. And then bishop c6, excellent um, redeployment of the bishop, hitting the weak a4 pawn. Queen to c2 to guard it. h6, gaining luft for the king, maybe keeping the knight off of g5, watching out for an attack on h7. h3, corresponding move. Uh, the knight sinks itself into b3 and cuts off the queen's defense of the a pawn, so the bishop is now threatening to take it. Um... Another line I wanted to look at was um, knight d7. Maybe a uh, plan is to get the knight to b6 to attack a4 further and win it. Uh, but that doesn't quite work because bishop b2, knight b6, and queen to c3 uh, forks a, a mate on g7 and the knight on a5. So that plan doesn't work. So uh, Ryshevsky finds the right plan, knight to b3, to attack a4, uh, bishop b2, and maybe he's threatening to break up the pawn structure over here, um, giving up this pawn, 
Black doesn't take it. He plays knight to d7, removing his knight. Maybe he didn't want to, to, to be captured on f6. Queen c3, threatening mate. f6, blocking. Uh, knight h2. And um, there's a lot going on here that I want to explain. The purpose of knight h2, I gather from the comments in the book, is uh, to play knight to g4. And there's this battery with the bishop and queen on this diagonal, and the knight can sacrifice itself, take one of these pawns, and then break open the, the dark square diagonal to the king, maybe get a perpetual check. Uh, Bronstein says, as time pressure approaches, the less strategy and the more tactics. Okay, so uh, White is hoping for some tactical resources in this position. He knows he's losing the A pawn. Okay, Ryshevsky plays knight b6, attacks that A pawn a second time, threatens to take it with the knight and fork the queen and bishop. And the comment here is, how to meet the threat of knight takes a4 is a question white was never called upon to answer. Because Ryshevsky, having four minutes left to make his last 16 moves, that's some serious time pressure, um, he offered a draw. So he played knight b6 and offered Nidorf a draw in this position. And Nidorf took it. The game ended here. Um, it says, evidently, he was unable to calculate fully the consequences of White's combination. Uh, knight to g4, knight takes a4, knight takes f6, check, uh, g takes f6, queen takes f6. So he was afraid of this sacrifice, couldn't calculate at all in his last four minutes, and offered a draw. Now, right after the game, and also in his published analysis after the tournament, uh, Nidorf showed that, yeah, he did indeed have a, a forced draw in that continuation. Let's take a look. Knight g4, knight takes a4. So knight takes f6, check. g takes f6, queen takes f6. Um, knight takes b2, guards against the battery along the diagonal. Uh, and then bishop g4, and white's intent is to take on e5 and then toggle back and forth, I mean e6, and toggle back and forth between e6 and f5 for a perpetual on the king. The queen has all the other squares covered. And there's one um, interesting line that was pointed out by the players. Uh, queen to g7 is interesting because it gives the black king and escape square on h8 from the, the perpetual on these two squares. But this is what would have happened. Bishop takes e6 check, king to h7, bishop to f5 check, king to h8 to hide from the perpetual, but then rook to d8 check. Rooks get traded, and now the queen is going to deliver a perpetual. Okay, queen to g8 is forced, queen to f6 check, and that's a perpetual. The queen is forced back here and go back here again. So apparently, and I think there are more lines to consider, but apparently white did have a forced draw um, in that particular continuation. So um, Ryshevsky probably felt good about that after he learned, learned after the game he, he wouldn't have won anyway. All right, so thanks for watching the video. We will look at more games from this excellent book in the near future.